is News 8 from Wood TV. It's been a year of tragedy and triumph. The next four nights here on The 7, we will look back at the stories that impacted West Michigan in 2023. We'll revisit some of Target 8's most impactful stories, stories that are reshaping your town and your neighborhood, and we'll accentuate the positive with stories that brought out the best in us, from tragedy on campus to a daring escape from the Maui wildfires. But first tonight, the reality of mass shootings hit Michigan State University students, their families, and the entire state when a lone gunman walked onto campus on a cold February night and began a shooting spree. That shooting ended with three students' lives cut short, five others seriously injured, and the gunman taking his own life. So we are very saddened to report that there has been an incident on the campus of Michigan State University. Three students, Ariel Anderson, Brian Frazier, and Alexandria Verner, all from the Detroit area, were killed. The shooter, Anthony McRae, turned the gun on himself hours after the shooting. In the days that followed, there were memorials and protests over gun violence and stories of survival. Here's News 8's Amanda Porter. Escaping an active shooter. Both Quinn Patrick and Alex Janetsky are students at Michigan State University. The sophomores caught their escape from IM East on video. Both students decided not to go to the student union as they usually would. They were at a basketball game at IM East when they received an email about an active shooter. Holy cow, we were just there. Um, and so all of the management of the referees and I am East, like, quickly kind of soon as fast as they could. So they said that no one can leave, like, we're going to lock down the place. A large group of students went into a small racquetball room and barricaded the door using anything heavy. Banner right next to us the entire time, trying to keep up update on the situation, where it was happening, what was going on. Quinn Patrick recording on cell phone video the pair's entire escape. Genuinely, I was scared and I thought, well, maybe this can be like almost proof if something were to happen. <laughs> if one of us were to get injured or if there was actually that person outside trying to get in, that I would have that in case to show anyone evidence. Any the students verified police were at the door. Thanking the officers who rescued the students, yet still running for her life. We were scared to be outside too because that's where he's out there. Was like he's, he wasn't caught yet. Like he could have been anywhere. Police found the active shooter, 43-year-old Anthony McRae, about five miles north of campus, dead after shooting himself. Quinn and Alex drove off campus to a friend's house, but their thoughts are with everyone impacted by this tragedy. Sorry to all like the families and students out there who have been affected. Um, sending a lot of love, and um, I couldn't imagine. Partisan politics also creating controversy in Ottawa County. In November of 2022, voters elected a slate of candidates backed by Ottawa Impact. The grassroots citizen group upset over COVID-era mask requirements and other mandates issued by the state and enforced by Ottawa County health officials to the County Board of Commissioners. Once those newly elected leaders took the oath of office, controversy ensued. Joe LaFergie breaks it down for us. The new board, backed by a group angry over mask mandates and other COVID restrictions turned political action committee, heard from a packed audience today at the county commission chambers, some with questions over transparency. Everything was done behind closed doors and then delivered as a fait accompli. One could argue none of the moves made by the new board should be a surprise. Not only impacts agenda spells them out, but last week's move to fire the county administrator and hire failed congressional candidate John Gibbs to replace him, shut down the county's Office of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, and hire an anti-mass advocate to run the health department never appeared on the board's agenda. Even some of the Ottawa Impact Back board members say while they still back the agenda, the process of getting there needs to be more open. I was uncomfortable by that and uh, how that took place. I think other commissioners were as well. And so what I'm trying to do is work hard with my fellow commissioners to improve that process. At the transparency thing, a lot of folks out there were saying, look, 
you keep doing these walk-on items on the agenda, that's not transparent enough. Maybe legal, but it's not transparent. What, right. How do you answer that? Uh, well, I... I you, you may not enter this room. This is uh, administrative area only. Okay. So that's not the only question of transparency. New board chair Joe Moss ducked today. The board also voted to hire a new law firm to represent the county. Common law firms specialized in cases fighting COVID restriction related lawsuits during the pandemic. Moss's business partner is the nephew of the firm's founder. But a vote to postpone Coleman's hiring and accept bids from other law firms went down by a 6 to 5 vote. And Coleman was hired with support from commissioners, including Moss. He wasn't answering questions about that either. Right. There, there is no conflict of interest, uh, but thank you for asking. Controversy continued with the attempted firing of County Health Officer Adeline Hambly over enforcement of COVID restrictions. The board's original plan was to replace Hambly with an Ottawa Impact member who handles health and safety protocols for a heating and cooling company. What followed was a battle that continues today in both the boardroom and the courtroom. News ace Byron Tollefson has followed each step of the controversy, including the debate on whether to give Hambly $4 million to walk away from the health department. I move. Deal or no deal? That's the question in Ottawa County. Discussions are being taken as more than what they are. They're just discussions. The legal issues in my mind are clear that there was a binding settlement. The attorney for top health officer Adeline Hambly wants a judge to enforce a settlement in which she'd get $4 million to resign next month. She says both sides agreed to a deal, citing emails agreeing on terms and the board voting to accept its lawyer's recommendation to settle. Them going out to vote and saying we're accepting the recommendation, we certainly thought of counsel for this deal. Um, that's enough to indicate objective confirmation that there's a meeting of the minds on the essential terms. The board Board's lawyer David Coleman says those emails were only tentative. A final settlement was never reached and hadn't been approved in writing yet. He counters that when the board voted, they were only approving settlement discussions and hadn't seen any emails indicating a final deal. There's differences with deliberations and settlement discussions versus offers. And I think maybe that's where some of this confusion has arisen. The 14th Circuit Court for the County of Muskegon is now in session. The, the debate was supposed to go in front of a Muskegon judge Monday morning. But she quickly delayed the hearing, saying she needs to review multiple motions from the county board's lawyer and the clerk, aimed to prevent witnesses from testifying, pushing things back until next Monday. We are going to hear argument on the various motions. There does not need to be, we're not going to take testimony, so any of the subpoenas, everybody can kind of... <laughs> Calm down a little bit. Monday's court appearance marks more than a month since the Board of Commissioners started its own hearing, considering firing Hambly. Tuesday afternoon, commissioners return for day six of that hearing. Whether they'll vote to fire Hambly or go behind closed doors again to talk other settlement possibilities is a mystery. Your guess is as good as mine? I don't know. I mean, I guess we'll see. The board could vote tomorrow. I mean, I, I, who knows? Hambly's attorney says she's trying to remain health officer under terms where she's protected going forward. She's not going to come back and face another termination hearing in a month. That's just not something anybody reasonable would do. At the end of the day, Coleman says a settlement is probably the best way to end all of this. Obviously, a global settlement of everything and kind of burying the hatchet and moving forward, I think, you know, a lot of people believe that would be best here at this point. But it's not possible when you have requests for $8 million and $4.5 million and $4 million. One of the Ottawa County Board's first decisions was to eliminate the County Office of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion. The move was seen to many as a step back in efforts to make Ottawa County more inclusive, a fact highlighted by Grand Haven's first ever Pride Festival in June. Taylor Morris has our story. Seeing how many people are here and how supportive everybody is, it makes you feel welcomed in a community. June is National Pride Month and people in Grand Haven came together in solidarity for the LGBTQ plus community. I've said numerous times throughout the day, how, look at how many allies are here. Not just, you know, you go to Pride and you see lots of LGBTQ and on, and it's very prominent, but then we got here and it was just allies everywhere. I grew up here and uh, back in the day, about 20 years ago when I first came out, I remember not feeling 
Like I walk down the pier and hold my girlfriend's hand. And now look at me. <laughs> look at all of us. Look at all of us here celebrating, feeling comfortable, proud, and out. This comes despite pushback from some members of the community. Back in May, the city council approved the festival's permit and declared June Pride Month. Also against today's event is Ottawa Impact, an ultra-conservative Christian group who began speaking out against the concept of diversity, equity, and inclusion. But I feel compelled to remind folks that any society that values justice must also value diversity, equity, inclusion, and tolerance. These are not... These are not dangerous and subversive ideas. We asked supporters at today's event how they feel about the subject. This is not anything about religion. It's about human rights as a human being and just supporting people. I grew up in Grand Haven. Um, it was a pretty sheltered community. And I think it's a huge deal for Grand Haven to embrace the pride you know, celebration and the LGBTQ community. People also say they are pleased to see Grand Haven come together regardless of recent events. It's just nice to see that we've overcome that obstacle, you know, obviously there's going to be pushback no matter what, and we turned out like it still happened. I mean, we're here, we're still celebrating. Coming up, tragedy in one southwest Michigan neighborhood. We recap a violent day in November and how the police and community responded. Plus, the community mourns a fallen hero. We'll take you to the funeral of a Paw Paw firefighter who was tragically killed in the line of duty. Gun violence continued to lead many of our newscasts in 2023. This is absolutely insane. Three murders in one day. In early November, Grand Rapids experienced one of the most violent days in recent history. Three people were shot dead in a five-hour period in the city's Burton Heights neighborhood. Police speculate all three shootings were related. I heard from the community yesterday that out there on the street on Horton that um, violent crime is not acceptable to them. It's not acceptable anywhere in the city of Grand Rapids, but that community is not going to tolerate it. Our entire community of Grand Rapids should be concerned. Not just Garfield Park Neighborhoods Association. This is a community concern. Tragedy wasn't exclusive to the big city in 2023. In February, while responding to fallen electrical wires during a winter storm, Paw Paw volunteer firefighter Ethan Quillen was electrocuted when another line came down. The 28-year-old's funeral was filled with messages of faith, honor, and tradition. Your family supported you and your passion. And now it's our turn to support them. Your family is our family. Rest easy, brother. We will take it from here. Still to come, an August tornado left a trail of devastation north of Grand Rapids. Blake Harms walks us through one of the hardest hit areas from that storm. Mother Nature also left her calling card in the summer of 2023. A hot, humid late August day helped spawn dangerous storms after the sun went down. At least one tornado and straight line winds cut a swath through West Michigan. Storm Team 8 meteorologist Blake Harms takes us to the scene of one hard hit area. We are in Comstock Park uh, near Pine Island Drive in Seven Mile, and this is the most substantial damage we've come across. This is at uh, Sand Trap and Scott View Drive so here in this little subdivision. You see their camper flipped over on its roof. Not only that, but just about every home on this row has substantial structural damage, whether it be siding, roofing. Uh, you can see a lot of windows blown out as well. 
and there is just stuff strewn all about this neighborhood. The reason for that is because, well, the roof came off of this home right here on Scott View Drive. The entire roof is gone. We talked to the homeowners earlier. We're not going camera. Said the daughter was up on the top floor when the storm began. They saw the gas grill start to fly away, and that's when they knew it was time to get down. And you can see all the damage that is done. They say the home may have to be demolished, waiting on insurance to get there. But we have stuff strewn all about the neighborhood here. We started off over at uh, on Alpine between six and seven mile. Some buildings were flattened there. And then we followed the path right over here to this subdivision. And again, this is the most substantial damage we've seen. Ran into a weather service survey team who are out determining the rating of this potential tornado. They said this is the worst damage they've seen here as well. Coming up, Hawaii was hit hard by deadly wildfires this year, and a few students from here in West Michigan were there when those fires broke out. We'll hear their story. There were also faraway tragedies that hit close to home. In August, wildfires swept through the Hawaiian island of Maui, killing at least 100 people and destroying thousands of buildings. But for two young women from West Michigan who went to Maui earlier in the summer for the adventure of a lifetime, the fires also proved just how resourceful and resilient they could be in the face of danger. Kyle Mitchell has their story. More than a week later, it's still hard for Emma Sutherland and Jessica Tosella to believe just how close they came to the fast-moving fires on Maui. The smoke looked like it was coming directly at you, like it was going in a straight line towards us. Emma, a daughter of a News 8 photographer, and her friend Jessica were spending the summer working in Lahaina on culinary internships. Losing power early in the morning was the first sign something was wrong. And then a little while later, one of my coworkers ended up saying, I have to go home to check on my kids, there's a fire. Um, and so he went home and that was kind of like the first point we knew that there was a fire, but we still just didn't really think too much about it, that it was going to be a real threat. The roommates thought the fire would soon be under control, but didn't know it had flared up and spread until their apartment manager knocked on their door. We could smell that smoke. We opened the door. Our smoke detectors were going off and it was just black outside. We couldn't see much and it was super windy. Everything was blowing in and that's when we realized how urgent this was. With no warning of the fire spreading in little time, they packed what they could. Flip over just a change of clothes and some necessities. We didn't bring any food. All of our stuff was left behind for the most part and that was all destroyed by the fire. The students then had to figure out how to get to safety as the flames spread. We didn't have a car. That was, I think, our biggest thing at first. Um, and our neighbor knocked and told us, here's some keys to a car. Just go. Um, so we got in the car and just started driving. With the roads clogged, getting to the north side of the island seemed like an impossible task. It was so dark. And even just as we were driving, it was getting worse. And we were just sitting in traffic trying to get out. They eventually took another route, and a drive that normally takes 50 minutes took four and a half hours. It was just hard to breathe, and it smelled terrible, and there was moments where we were getting out through Front Street where there was power lines down, and I was getting nervous going under those. After the smoke had cleared, Bakery Lahaina, where Emma worked, was destroyed, and Chemo's Lahaina, where Jessica worked, was also now just a memory. We feel blessed that we had a place to come back to where so many people have nothing left over there and they don't have a place to come to. Grateful to have survived, they are concerned about what happens to the people on the island who lost everything. Nearly everybody I know back in Maui lost their home. Um, a lot of them are in the shelters and a lot of, you know, supplies and resources, they are available, but I just worry about what's next for them. Thanks for joining us. Tomorrow, we'll look back at the projects that are changing the skylines and neighborhoods of West Michigan.